Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for uh, what promises to be a really fascinating discussion about data, philanthropy, and philosophy. Um, the panel here uh, represents two organizations that are uh, taking a new approach uh, to philanthropy, uh, which is data-led and evidence-based. Um, so let me just kick off really quickly here with, with, with a question for all of you. So you all say that you use a uh, data and evidence-based approach to funding projects. What do you mean by that? Are other charities not using an evidence-based approach? Maybe we'll start with Natalie. Good question. Um, so, broadly speaking, we often talk about, well, what is rational philanthropy? Um, and I want to start by clarifying that being rational fundamentally is not a moral question. Being rational means acting in such a way that you achieve your goals. And so an organization could set out to have any number of goals. Um, it could be to provide kittens in your hometown with tiny little mittens. And if you set out to do that in a way that you actually then achieve that, then that is rational. But I think that's not what people really mean when they're talking about rational philanthropy. I think they're talking about, well, what goals should you pursue as well? Which is strictly speaking separate. Um, but the way we approach that is we think it is worthwhile to have this goal of helping as many individuals as possible by as much as possible. And in order to achieve that goal, we're going to need to use the sort of best available evidence as well as reasoning, because that's something that's really hard to do. And I think a premise that we all sort of um, base a lot of our work on is the fact that many people do in fact share this goal, whether or not the first time they think about philanthropy, this is something they come to consider. Um, perhaps Danielle can speak more about this in terms of the value discovery approach at Founders Pledge. But often I think people say they want to work on a particular disease or a particular empowerment program. They're strictly not tied to that and actually more broadly, they just want to help individuals by as much as possible. Um, I suppose I'd also add the reason why we're so obsessed with this idea of trying to find out what works best is because having a focus on effectiveness, I think can mean the difference between achieving nothing with your philanthropy despite your best efforts and really radically transforming the world. So many people seem to think that the difference between a sort of average charity and a good charity is about one and a half. And the data suggests actually the difference between an average charity and a really good charity could be hundreds or thousands of times. So, so this is a power law distribution as, exactly. as we say in VC um, and so on. Exactly, mm. yeah. What, what is a, maybe Danielle, you, you, you have something to add here. What is a canonical example of a, uh, a, a, a type of giving that is thought to be rational, but yeah. actually is revealed not to be? Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of examples of this, and, and just to start, I think we all would like to believe that we could make these decisions really easily on our own. And most of the data suggests that uh, we're really quite bad at predicting just on our kind of good intentions alone, what charities will be effective. There's an organization called 80,000 Hours that recently did a study on uh, how well we can predict whether a charity actually achieves its outcomes. And it turns out, uh, out of 10 possible charity interventions, we could predict um, which are going to produce the best outcomes about, about four out of 10 times, which is roughly what you'd get if you just randomly selected. So humans are quite bad at this. Um, to, to kind of your point on charity effectiveness, there are some charities that are that far outperform 100 or 1,000 times charities at average. But the other thing we're also trying to mitigate against is, is charities that actually do more harm than good. And so, you know, I really try to, to, to work with a lot of the philanthropists in our community to understand that we have a moral responsibility to, to care um, and to not just go with our intuition because we also need to mitigate against the risk of doing more harm than good. Yeah, and, and further to that, I think what people often just neglect to consider is that when you choose to give to one particular cause, that means that you're not giving to others. And at least to me, I think, you know, if I'm donating my resources, I only have limited resources. Um, you know, it would make me very sad to then find out that because I had a particular, you know, pre-existing notion that this was what I cared about and, and failed to look into what the other options are and then find out that actually I could have been 10, you know, I could have saved 10 times as many lives by giving to the other charity, then, well, that's a, a real shame. Sure. So, Liv, 
you're one of the world's best poker players. Uh, you won the World Series Once of Poker. Once upon a time. <laughs> uh, you're an ambassador to Effective Giving, which is Natalie's organization. Uh, you talk to lots of people all the time about taking this approach uh, to giving. What, what are the common responses that you've encountered and, and what do you counter that with? Yeah, I mean, so most of the people who I've sort of historically spoken to about, about sort of upgrading their philanthropy were, were poker players. And, and poker players typically um, are already quite quantifiably minded people. You know, they think, they, you know, when they choose a game to play in, they'll always think about sort of their hourly rates and their return on investment. Um, and so it was actually quite, I, I found they, they, they sort of grasped this concept of almost like return on investment in terms of good return for the donation that you give um, quite easily. Um, that said, a sort of common pushback that people understandably would give is like, well, you know, who are we to say that someone's effort of doing good is better than someone else's? Um, and I can I can sympathize with that, with that, uh, with that question because I mean, yeah, like it, if someone is doing a good thing, you don't want to say that's not good. But at the same time, it it's an unfortunate fact of the world that because we have limited resources to give, that if we don't care about you know achieving more good or ideally the most good, then, then ultimately the, the, the recipients lose out. Well, so how do you, how do you convince them? What do you do? Um, continuous conversations, really. And, yeah. and I mean, like, a, like an example that sometimes, I remember one that stuck out to me was someone said, well, my mother died of breast cancer, so I want to make sure that no one else's mother dies of breast cancer. Totally understandable thing. So then I asked the question, well, well, so what you really care about is that no one loses their mother, right? And they're like, yeah, exactly. I was like, well, then why don't you look in to see what in the world causes most people's mothers to die? And they're like, huh, because ultimately, whether they die from breast cancer or from some other horrible avoidable thing, you know, well, it, it's still the same consequence for the, for the loved ones and for that poor person. So I think it's about sort of zooming out instead of focusing on such a nuanced thing and zoom out and go, let's look at the big picture. How do I save the most people? Sure. Um, so, Nestle, Effective Giving, uh, you've received a pledge from uh, Ben Dilo, right? The billionaire behind BitMEX, one of the biggest uh, cryptocurrency derivative exchanges uh, in the world. Um, and Danielle, you're with Founders Pledge and you work with startup founders and executives uh, to figure out how they can effectively uh, uh, give back. Um, so, my question is, you know, tech founders and investors already, they already won, right? They run the world. Um, do we really need philanthropy to also uh, mirror and amplify their particular interests and their particular biases? So I think that's a, a very important question. It's part of where our kind of focus on rational giving really comes into play. So you can ima imagine a world in which if everyone was acting just on their personal interests, so I am a violist, I might want to only give to foundations that support violas, um, that is going to very much skew the, the future. And so part of why we apply re evidence and we apply data is to help people see the world beyond what they've known before. Um, Founders Pledge particularly works with technologists in part because we believe that they also can help be a part of the solution for a lot of the biggest challenges that we're facing today. So on something like climate change, um, we'd be pretty naive to think that charity alone is going to address this really large global problem. And so we're engaging leaders from the clean food tech business, from you know new energy technologies to be a part of a solution, not only philanthropically, but also in designing the next technologies to address the these global problems. Sure, Natalie. Yeah, I'd say a couple of things about that. Um, first of all, I think while it's absolutely true that tech companies are going to have a huge influence in shaping our future, that uh, the philanthropy undertaken by those founders is extremely important, we want to remain somewhat measured. I think there might be a little bit of overhype about the sort of extent and reach of billionaire tech philanthropy. Uh, for example, estimates indicate that Every year for the last few years, billionaire tech philanthropy has been about $10 billion a year, which is substantial. However, if we put it in context, for example, California recently announced that one of its uh, high-speed train programs is going to go over budget a bit by $40 billion. So one government overspend on one project in one state is equivalent to all billionaire philanthropy for the last four years. So it's huge. but. We need to put it in context of the rest of spending. And I think also 
this emphasizes how important it is to then make sure that every philanthropic dollar we spend in the world is, is spent as well as possible, uh, where that's the aim. Because really, the way to have impact is going to be to nudge larger institutional uh, spenders, such as governments. And then I suppose the second thing I would say, um, if we look at who's the archetypal tech billionaire philanthropist, um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation comes to mind. They were one of the really early pioneers of evidence-based philanthropy. And they have done incredible things. Um, they've pledged three billion to working on malaria, on uh, and eradicating polio, on other neglected diseases. By some estimate, just those programs alone have caused $200 billion of social and economic progress. Uh, and if we compare, say, that sort of tech philanthropy to the current status quo of philanthropy, where is, where is the money going? Um, in the US last year, about a third of it went to religion. About 15% of it went to education, a large part of which was higher education. So the sort of status quo for parts of tech philanthropy, to me, on some measures, does look quite a lot better than the status quo of general philanthropy. Um, and perhaps we want to actually amplify some of those biases towards data and towards evidence and towards impact that the tech founders do seem to have. Um, I want to take a question from the audience here. We have a question that says, um, if, if effective giving is based on fact and not emotion, where do we find the facts? And I think that's a salient question in the kind of information ecosystem we exist in today. Um, I don't know, Liv, if you have a question, uh, a, a thought or? I mean, well, where, where do we find the facts? So obviously it's, you know, it's, it's, it's always going to be a very complex and, and messy thing to, to find exact data on, but you start off by, you know, sort of employing the scientific method. You know, doing um, randomized control trials, um, you know, to actually, you know, coming up with a hypothesis and, and testing it in the field against control groups um, and, and finding out if, you know, th those specific interventions work. Um, you know, that's, that's a starting point. Um, but then, yes, you do have to go into more um, sort of more speculative things, you know, if some of the some of the hard data is hard to get, you have to think about. You sort of do like a Fermi estimate, where you you try and you, you try and quantify um, some of these some of these factors. And uh, you know, but the point is, is that it's it's much better to do to try and put a number on these things than leaving it completely undefined, which. Again, unfortunately, is the main, like, largely the status quo in, in much of philanthropy. We're all quite focused on outcomes versus outputs. I think a lot of charities historically have focused on outputs. I can give a really kind of simple example. So I know there have been a number of proponents to clean water who have been speaking at Web Summit this year. And if you care about delivering clean water to people, um, one way you could go about measuring whether or not your dollars have had impact is to measure the number of wells that have been built with your money. That is an output-based way of measuring um, something. An outcome instead would be, are people actually healthier? Are they you know, drinking this water? And the distinction is really important because you can imagine that you might be able to, to build 15 new wells, but if people couldn't actually access those wells, or if for whatever reason it wasn't clean water they were drinking, then your money didn't achieve the, the outcome that you hoped for. So a big part of the, the drive of the movement that we're all part of on this effective giving is a focus on outcomes um, and working both with charities and philanthropists to start to really put pressure on the space of philanthropy to be data-driven in this way. Um, I want to ask you real quick, and we have some great questions coming to the floor. I want to ask you real quick, um, what is one area that you're recommending uh, your donors put, put their funds towards, right? What's the most high impact area? And then we have a question from the floor from Khan who says, who asks, where can the average person go to get advice when they don't have the time or resources to do all their research? So one resource and one uh, impact area. Great. I'll start with the, the resource question. It's super easy for us. Go to founderspledge.com. Uh, we list a number of high impact cause areas as well as pretty in-depth research that tries to make it really simple for you to figure out where your dollars can do the most good. So in most of our cause areas, we recommend one or two charities that are delivering outsized returns on areas like climate change, women's empowerment, etc. Um, the first question you had about a, an area that I'm excited about or um, where we see high impact giving, I 
we'll speak about kind of global poverty alleviation. So there's an organization called Give Directly, which essentially has this very novel idea of if you give people money, they will do the most good with it. And it turns out the research really kind of bears that out. And in our movement of effective giving, we think a lot about using just direct cash transfer as the baseline for does an intervention provide more good than that? And if not, we should really just be giving people cash and empowering them to make their own decisions. So um, there's, there are charities that work specifically in this area. Sure. Uh, for me, the resource I would recommend, um, so it's specifically more tailored towards people who are trying to decide what to do with their lives to achieve the maximum possible impact, uh, and it's called 80,000hours.org. Um, and it's, you know, it's mostly aimed at younger people who are perhaps deciding, you know, what, what should they what should they work in or what should they study in order to achieve the maximum possible good with their brain power and their time. Um, but it also gives uh, advice to older people and it has a fantastic podcast that sort of discusses these sort of effective giving adjacent uh, concepts. And then in terms of a, a sort of cause area that's a priority to me, um, I think one that sort of ticks the three boxes of uh, not only massive scale, um, solvability, but also massively neglected, and that's um, animal factory farming. Uh, it's, I think, somewhere around is 80 billion animals a year uh, are killed uh, for food. Okay, fine, but it's the, it's not fine. Um, but the, 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 the standards of living that they are put in are so horrific. Like most people, you know, would never dream of keeping a dog like that for one day, and yet they're okay with, you know, pigs and, and, and cows and so on uh, living torturous lives. And so I think that's an area that there's uh, is, is so ext extraordinarily neglected, and you can do a lot of good with a surprisingly small amount of money. Of course, and the philosopher Peter Singer articulated that argument Absolutely. so well in the 70s. Um, and he's also talked a lot about uh, effective altruism. Um, Natalie. In terms of a cause area, I would recommend people look into if they're interested. Um, I completely uh, agree and endorse with my fellow panelists and would also add work to reduce uh, existential and catastrophic risk. So humanity is living at a time of unprecedented risk uh, from a number of sources, from things such as nuclear accidents, um, the potential for engineered pandemics, the potential for unaligned um, artificial general intelligence. There's a lot we can do to mitigate these risks, which are currently unacceptably high. In terms of resources, I would very much uh, encourage everyone also to check out Founders Pledges research, which is excellent, and what I think will direct you to, to relevant cause area experts as well. So very quickly, we're in future societies. Um, do you think there's a risk of too much centralization? You know, you have to put your faith in these experts to tell you, uh, to interpret the data for you. Uh, where do things like blockchain technologies and decentralization in general fit in in, in, this, in this movement? I mean, I don't... It, it, with something, you know, when it comes to, like, figuring out what are the biggest problems in the world and how we solve them, unfortunately, you know, that is going to be something that will ultimately fall into the domain of, of expertise. You know, these are incredibly tough problems to solve, and so it seems unlikely that sort of... You know, always. I mean, there will always be wisdom of the crowd, but I think you can't, it can be dangerous to defer to that too much. Um, and in terms of blockchain, I mean, it's a fantastic technology, and for sort of, I, I just, I, I just don't see how it would quite marry up with with sort of the intense, the incredibly complex and tough research that needs to be done cool. in this particular case. Well, thank you for that. Uh, we are over time, um, but this conversation uh, is endlessly fascinating. It can continue in many angles. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.